Hello. I'm talking with Dr. Paul Elevitz of Ramapo College, who has just published in April of 2018, The Making of Psychohistory, Origins, Controversies, and Pioneering Contributors. <laughs> Dr. Elevitz is a professor of Ramapo College since it opened in the early 70s. He also founded in 1982 the Psychohistory Forum, which meets in New York City and is still meeting. And in 1994, he started the journal Cleo's Psyche, which has been a quarterly for many years. Dr. Elevitz, until your book was published, there had never, ever been a history of psychohistory. Why is it important to have such a history? Well, psychohistory is an extraordinarily useful instrument for understanding the human condition and has a long and little known uh, you know, history. Given the enormous literature that's been created uh, and the high quality of so many of the books and, and journals uh, that exist, um, it's amazing that there has been no previous uh, comprehensive history of the field. Not everybody knows what psychohistory is, so why don't you say what psychohistory is and talk about the subspecialties within the field? Well, psychohistory is uh, an amalgam of psych psychoanalysis, history, psychology, uh, the social sciences, and humanities. Uh, a willingness to probe the unconscious and focus on motivation are crucial aspects of psychohistory. It's um, uh, its specialties are creativity, uh, dream work, group dynamics, uh, the history of childhood, uh, studying psychobiography, including of leaders in presidential psychobiography, uh, trauma studies, and unconscious motivation, uh, especially the differences between conscious intention and uh -huh. uh, actual uh, behavior. There's a lot to it. Oh, yes. Well, you came to psychohistory early on, and you have been, you're the only person who has been attending and presenting at every conference of the International Psychohistorical Association since it first met in 1978. How does your experience within the field of psychohistory illuminate the history of psychohistory and what you've done in your book? Well, like most people who, who came to psychohistory, uh, I learned about psychohistory simply because it was an interesting methodology. I happened to be at uh, Temple University in the latter 19, uh, 1960s, uh, where I learned about it. Uh, when I came, moved to start Rambo College with 53 other colleagues in 71, I then joined the uh, Institute uh, for Psychohistory. Uh, and uh, went into psychoanalytic training. Uh, I was very excited uh, when, at the idea of a of a international group, uh, and and became uh, a leader of it, uh, going uh, and becoming president. Uh, and uh, and at this point, I'm on the uh, monthly uh, teleconference planning committee, uh, which you run as the current president of of the uh, international, and uh, which are so helpful in, in doing good work for psychohistory and expanding it. What, is the, what was the Institute of Psychohistory that you were first a part of? Uh, that was a group that Lloyd de Moss started, uh, and it, was, um, it uh, was part of his burst of energy uh, to build a, f a field that he was very um, involved in. Um, he uh, started a printing press, uh, the journal History of Childhood Quarterly, which became the Journal of Psychohistory. Um, he, he wrote uh, various books, including the History of Childhood and the, uh, uh, you know, the Emotional Life of Nations, uh, and uh, edited a variety of other ones. Um, so he, he was really the most important organizer of psychohistory, not the first, but the most important organizer okay. and the most controversial as well. Now, one of the things you're known for 
is that you have written accounts of presidential aspirants' biographies since Jimmy Carter ran in 1976. How does someone who, like you, who was trained as a European historian, become interested in a, becoming a psychobiographer of presidential candidates? How did that happen? Well, I, I, I had picked up a copy of Jimmy Carter's campaign autobiography, Why Not the Best? And uh, it struck me that this, this man is unusually open uh, for a presidential candidate. So at a uh, summer in institute psychohistory meeting, I said, someone ought to go to Plains, Georgia and uh, interview uh, those close to him, for Plains being a little town of uh, 600 people. And uh, Lloyd DeMoss said, well, you go, Paul. I said, no, I hesitated. Uh, I've had all my responsibilities to patients and students, <laughs> et cetera. But despite this hesitation, uh, a little over a week before the election, I was down in Plains, Georgia, uh, interviewing uh, his mother, his uh, sister, uh, school teachers, uh, uh, some of the African, uh, African American help within the house, his best black friend uh -huh. as opposed to white friend, who I did get to when he grew up, and really formed a picture and had a treasure trove that Lillian Carter, his mother, brought down from the attic, which was uh, his, uh, his Annapolis diaries. Okay. Uh, which were extraordinarily revealing and in ways frightening uh, because he showed signs of self-destruction in them. I see. Uh, there's also lots of schoolwork uh, that uh, revealed a lot about his character, including his hesitancy um, in, being a, in being a leader, something he desperately wanted to do. I see. So you learned a lot. Is that what got you hooked? on doing psychobiographies from then until now? Yes, uh, that was the starting point. I was always, I, I pa care passionately about our country and who leads it. And, uh, but I had never seen it as uh, anything more than I as a, as a concerned citizen uh, would follow very closely. Uh, now, uh, it, it just became a part of my scholarship of as a result in 43 publications, and which as, uh, takes incredible time because you don't know which of, of these people is going to actually uh, be the winner. And my specialty is identifying, getting out to the public um, information about uh, the personality, the lifestyle, the coping mechanisms, what kind of president would the leading candidates be. So you try to bring psychohistorical insight into the character of the candidates so that people can be more informed about making votes and then also about what may happen should they become president. Absolutely, and uh, people don't necessarily listen uh, as in the recent uh, election, but uh, uh -huh. uh, I make my assessments of the different candidates doing comparisons in the last, oh, pushing 20 years of the, uh, of the two uh, candidates, one from each party. Well, since you've been in psychohistory, since the current wave started in the 60s and 70s, what do you think is the most important things that people should know about the history of psychohistory? It's a very old and rich history. Psychohistorical, with a hyphen, was first utilized in um, 1840, uh, the movement uh, began in the Freud circle uh, at the very beginning of the 20th century, not, uh, not very sophisticated, in not a very sophisticated way. It gradually, um, uh, be more and more work was written, especially uh, in the Germanic world in the United States. Uh, and so there's an enormous amount of material before you get to the uh, Wellfleet, which is uh, the uh, group that was started out in Wellfleet on Cape Cod uh, by uh, Robert J. Lifton, uh, who wanted to- And that was 1966, right? 66. He wanted to 
spread and further the ideas of Eric Erickson, uh, and he brought together a group. It's an in invitation-only group, which, uh, regrettably, because of age, Eric uh, Lifton uh, no longer uh, meets regularly, though they meet for lunch. Uh, he's in his early 90s. Um, and it, it, so that was the earliest group and the longest running group. <laughs> and so that's one of the main historical marking points is Wellfleet started by Robert Lifton, who in 66 and a few years later published Death and Life, which won the National Book Award. In trying to write the history of psychohistory, there must have been opportunities and obstacles you ran across. What were they? <laughs> I needed incredible knowledge to, to write about this field. And uh, but the, the obstacles were pri primarily uh, internal. Um, I, it seemed like hubris to me to uh, pride to want to uh, encompass all this very rich material with all the different personalities. Uh, but then, as I realized, so many wonderful colleagues had, had died and that uh, uh, so many others were in the uh, last decades of their lives that uh, it, had, it had to be done um, and done soon because otherwise so much of the rich history and personalities would be lost. I had certain advantages in that I published interviews of over 60 colleagues in featured scholar, uh, editor, clinician interviews. Uh, I also had published, uh, very sadly, some 35 memorials uh, in Clio Psych. And all this is on our website so that people can go to it and get a sense of the richness of the field. And it's Clio Psyche. Dot Cleopsyche, uh, dot org. Dot org. Were there obstacles in finding documents and sources, such as, say, Wellfleet's by invitation only? They've written some, wealthy people have written some accounts of things, but did you have, were there more documents you wish you had or more testimony that you wish you had? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I wish I could have cloned myself and uh, been. Uh, been in the Chicago area, uh, in the West Coast, so I did get a lot of material uh, from people, especially in LA, and I've worked for 30 years to have close contact. Wellfleet itself was a special difficulty. Uh, Robert J. Lifton uh, welcomed me to interview him, uh, and uh, you can find a, both a long interview and a fest thrift, uh that I put together on Lifton because I was tired of writing those memorials. I wanted to honor people like Lifton and Lowenberg and uh, Vulcan uh, and so forth while they were alive uh, rather than them to be known. But the difficulties of Wellfleet were the, um, they very deliberately kept it very quiet. Uh, members of Wellfleet, some of whom I have close relations with, wouldn't talk about uh, the details of what they were doing. Um, my request to join was was not accepted, um, and uh, so it was. So my knowledge was limited uh, of Wellfleet, except for those very early years. Uh, though um, uh, I could go to some of the books that follow that were written by people who were at Wellfleet. Right. right. Uh, but um, that's one of the weak spots, um, and I I don't fault myself because I did everything I could. Well, one of the main features and attractions of the book is that you do portraits of six prominent psychohistorians, one of which, of course, is Robert J. Lifton. What led you to choose these particular six? Why these and not others? And what did these six do that contributed to the intellectual, intellectual development of the field of psychohistory? Well, I've covered Lloyd de Moss pretty much. So he's one of them. He, Lifton is two. Uh, Lifton, uh, who, who gave up his 
professorship at Yale to come to New York to organize a center on violence and human survival and do very good work okay. there. Uh, and who's, uh, he is uh, the most prominent uh, public intellectual among the psychohistorians, though he doesn't necessarily living, lead. Living. Lifton. Yeah. Lifton doesn't necessarily <laughs> lead with that designation. Well, you mean living psychohistorians? Or you mean uh, altogether psychohistorians? Altogether okay. psychohistorians in terms of prominence. Okay. But, um, okay. Well, you know, Lifton was more prominent. Uh, so, uh, and, sorry, Erickson okay. was more prominent okay. than Lifton. And Lifton mm -hmm. has carried on uh, the tradition of Erickson and expanded it okay. with his, so many of his wonderful works. Uh, the uh, Van McVulcan, uh, a Cypriot Turkish American psychiatrist uh, who has written oh, at least 60 books in various languages and founded a, uh, a center at the University of Virginia uh, studying uh, conflict um, and it work, has gone into conflict centers uh, to try and avert uh, wars. Uh, he is uh, it's a very interesting case uh, of, uh, of someone who came a little bit later to psychohistory but realized uh, that uh, these weren't just academic tools uh, isolated from society. Uh, as a matter of fact, all three of these, uh, uh, DeMoss, Lifton, and, and Vulcan, very much committed uh, to bringing peace to the world. The second three of the six are Peter Gay, a uh, incredibly talented uh, and industrious European historian who uh, w went into psychoanalytic training but always was very uh, careful about uh, not steering his students into it because of prejudices in academic history and academic psychology. Uh, towards the field and he didn't want to hurt their careers. Um, uh, and so he's uh, you know, one of those that I interviewed. In fact, uh, I've interviewed or arranged for interviews for all of these six people. Uh, the next is uh, Rudolf Binion, uh, who is a personal friend, an utterly brilliant uh, uh, scholar and psychohistorian who did group work partly because he became disillusioned when his first book on Fra Lu. He did group work. Uh, yeah, he studied how groups function. Um, and um, incredible erudition. Uh, and uh, his first book on Fra Lu was, ba was psychoanalytic. And he really, without analysis, because he didn't have it, uh, and a good sense of the unconscious uh, in individuals, he felt it was a failure, though it's brilliant and worth reading. Um, the third individual is Peter Lowenberg, okay. who's had a wonderful career uh, as a uh, historian, a psychohistorian, uh, and uh, was able, 1971, as a young scholar before uh, the history, uh, formal academic history community, uh, sort of closed its doors to psychohistory. He had two articles in the journal uh, American Historical Review. Um, and so uh, though out there 80 psychohistorians uh, or contributors to the field I write about in this uh, book, uh, those six are the ones that were deserving of their names and chapter titles. Uh, Eric Erickson, uh, in fact, got more space than any of those who I didn't uh, p put his name in the chapter title, partly because he, he didn't like the use of the term psychohistory. Uh, and, uh, and that was, uh, and uh, he, but his early work is very important and he certainly inspired a number of people to come to the field. Getting back to some of your own work. Mm -hmm. So, you write about presidential candidates as we've talked about. Tell me what psychobiographies can offer about American political leaders 
that you can't get from other approaches, whether biographical or historical in other ways. What's the advantage of psychobiography? You get to know the inner man uh, and someday woman. Okay. Um, you, you get uh, past their defenses, how they want to be seen uh, and how they're generally seen. It's um, an incredibly useful tool for getting to the depth uh, of the personality. Uh, you also, of course, do what political scientists and historians uh, and other scholars do with that person. You study them incredibly intensely uh, and look for their life patterns and how they respond to trauma, how they respond to pressure. Which under the presidency, there's incredible right. Right. pressure. Right. So you talked about Jimmy Carter. Since 1980, when Reagan ran to the present, what would you say have been the most important things about individual presidential candidates you've learned? Very briefly, that having a good character uh, is no certainty of, of being a successful president. Uh, for example, Jimmy Carter ha was a more conscientious, a character bound uh, president uh, than uh, most, any, most other 20th century presidents. Uh, and the same you could say for her. Herbert Walker, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. However, um, Ronald Reagan was incredibly more successful as a president because he was able to feel the pulse of the American public and go with it and make Americans feel better about themselves, uh, which these other two did not, which is why they were one term presidents. I'm not saying the policies were better. Right. But in politics, you've got to be attuned to the public pulse. So among the people who've run for president since 1976 and been elected, would you say Reagan is the one who had the best political sense? Or are there others whose political sense were as strong as Reagan's and then made them influential and popular? Anybody else? Or you'd say Reagan is the top of the heap here? Uh, Bill Clinton, uh, despite his, his, his numerous faults, um, was had a very good uh, sense of the uh, of the public, uh, too chameleon-like, but he also was able to get a fair number of things done. Um, presidency is an incredibly tough job. So. You champion psychohistory and have for, for a long time. But in research universities, psychohistory is not always welcome. <laughs> What's been the negative side of that? And has there been positive aspects to the field of psychohistory that it's not, a part, not an integral part of the academy at Research One universities? Uh, it there um, it would have been good if the history and psychology academic psychology uh, departments had accepted psychohistory and done what what had happened with other fields like ec economic history, which was rejected, uh, but once they had a foothold, the uh, the scholars. Uh, <laughs> trained younger psychohistorians who went out and spread the gospel. And now, no self-respecting major university will be without an economic historian. The, uh, the, but at these universities, when people are doing important work, they discover they need psychohistory. Uh, at least many of them do. And the result is they're doing it. They don't advertise it as such. Uh, most of the, uh, the since Peter Lauenberg retired, uh, and Rudy Binion and a bunch of other talented people died, uh, the psychohistory is not taught uh, at the research university level. 
but uh, built, uh, they, by Zell, taught 8,000 students uh, at a community college in the CUNY system. Um, Dennis O'Keefe, uh, I, and a few other people uh, are teaching undergraduate courses called psychohistory, courses that are really psychohistorical, but not called that of course proliferate. These days, I can't teach anything but that it's psychohistorical, whatever label you put on it. Well, what do you see the future of psychohistory being? I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm hopeful. You didn't, you've never told me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hopeful that uh, as the older generation, which uh, in the later 70s and 80s came down strongly uh, against psychohistory in these uh, key departments uh, dies out, that uh, younger people will say, hey, psychology, history, uh, they make sense together and not simply rely on their own uh, off-the-cuff uh, type of, of uh, psychological analysis because we all make right. psychological okay. assumptions. I want to thank you for talking to me about this. Again, it's The Making of Psychohistory by Paul H. Elevitz. It was published in April of 2018 by Rutledge and is available in the usual places. Paul, thank you. Thank you.